Hello, good morning and welcome. I'm very pleased to see people uh, in person as opposed to on the other side of some amorphous internet screen. Um, we're going to talk about the software factory today, some supply chain fun, and uh, yeah, thank you for coming to my talk in advance. So, Kubernetes supply chain security, the software factory, aka who is afraid of the big bad supply chain. Hi, I'm Andy. I'm from Control Plane. We are a cloud native security consultancy. We have audit, pen test, and engineering capabilities, and I have a wonderful team. Uh, I've, I've done lots of development. That's kind of where the background comes from. Security is a, a deep passion, and operations, of course, is necessary. Is the strong baseline on which to, which to build solid security engineering practices. I am very Lucky to have had the opportunity to write SANS SEC 584, Attacking and Defending Containers and Kubernetes. Uh, with my preeminent co-author, Mr. Michael Hassenblas, I have written the book Hacking Kubernetes. It has gone into print today. It will be available on ebook by the end of the week. It's already available on early access. And uh, yeah, huge thanks to Michael. It is a step-by-step -step guide to attacking, defending, and ultimately securely deploying Kubernetes um, <laughs> for regulated environments and everywhere else. And today we are going to talk about the supply chain. What is it? Why is it a problem? Then we will look concretely at how to attack a couple of different supply chains, specifically um, at install time for a package. And secondarily, if I can get malicious code running in your Kubernetes clusters, what can I do? We will look at signing. Signing is the fated mechanism by which to fix all these things. Signing is easy, verification is hard. And finally, draw everything together with the software factory pattern. The panacea, potentially not, but certainly a useful advancement in our journey. There has been so much chat about the supply chain already at KubeCon. There was a supply chain security con on Monday. SIG Security, or TAG Security as they are now, ran the security day yesterday. And there's so much going on in the ecosystem right now. We're really moving forward after a difficult, I guess, kind of a few years of stasis as we build out new package managers and kind of since OCI existed. So there is a lot here. I will be referencing other talks throughout. So what is a supply chain? It is anything that we depend upon. In a military context, this could be the individual nuts and bolts that go into your aircraft carriers, your collectively. Uh, pharmaceutically, it is how we get drugs from a factory into a person without them dying from some sort of contamination on the way. Same for food. Manufacturing is your kind of just-in-time um, Toyota-style manufacturing. And software. Software is built of other pieces of software, and each of them has an independent supply chain. As a consumer, it is beyond our direct control. We have to have that trust in the previous steps. And finally, it is reliant on trust, which is never a solid thing on which to base, and so something we need to look at in depth. So for a software supply chain, any code that ends up running in production is part of the supply chain. What could possibly go wrong, we ask ourselves. Potentially a lot. We rely upon our producers to have done things sensibly, and we can't necessarily always validate those things that they have done. So as we move into this post-bare metal, uh, sort of cloud-native renaissance future, everything is defined as software. That extends from of course, the applications that have always been software, but the infrastructure is now programmable. Our security is now defined, and the same with policy, as code. It's reproducible, it's statically analyzable. And this is, this is really useful for us because it ensures reproducibility. It gives us the advantage of being able to test things in all sorts of different dimensions and domains. And it means that with consistency, we can apply the same st style and type of controls to each of those things. So static analysis and linting is a fine example. In the Kubernetes world, everything is declarative, and therefore we can define what a good baseline state looks like and test it. So from a software factory perspective, we're potentially building anything and everything software 
What could that be? Well, various different examples here. Artifacts, the, the um, actual deployment into clouds that we're, that we're doing into some of those platforms, all the way through infrastructure, and especially our security and NFRs. Importantly, if we are going to use full build automation for all of these things, which of course we should do, segregation of the build service becomes important because the privilege afforded to a security based build server or perhaps something that's going and rotating certificates in networking appliances, etc., that should probably be so isolated, segregated, and on its own managed network that it's not visible to a lot of the rest of the organization. So supply chain, everything is software. We compose software of other pieces of software, and we rely, rely upon our producers for safety. Uh, this is correct and non-violent in, uh, in the, the classic sense. What does that mean? Well, if we have a supply chain here with Bob in the middle, Bob, as you see, delivers Alice's code to Charlie. If Bob drops some malware, an implant, some malicious software, which does not perform the highest and best use of, uh, of the infrastructure that it's on, perhaps, it's very difficult to detect. And this process of uh, malicious supply chain insertion is something that we've seen happen more and more and increasingly um, becomes the new attack surface. Supply chains are very long and difficult to secure because not all of the events occurring in the supply chain are even visible to us. And when we say the new software security uh, frontier, we're actually talking back to reflections on trusting trust, the seminal paper on uh, malicious compilers that build malware into their outputs. So there we are. We must essentially trust everything in a supply chain. And this is where things get really difficult because if we don't trust each and every step, that's the insertion point at which stage potentially um, some malicious code is inserted into a compiled artifact. Uh, very difficult to detect because you have to perhaps reverse engineer or decompile the thing in order to understand if there's a malicious side effect from the implant, as we'll call it. There we go, the reflections on trusting trust, uh, Mr. Thompson himself. Okay, so let's look at how to attack a supply chain. Um, the book features an archetypal 8-bit adversary. This is Captain Hashjack and uh, his many guises. This malicious adversary wants to run his code in our production systems. It's really that simple. It doesn't matter if that's crypto mining or popping a reverse shell, which we'll look at in a moment. Uh, or, in, in fact, just uh, adding ourselves or adding our infrastructure to a command and control network so we can use that at a later point, perhaps bounce other malicious traffic through it, use it for something like a watering hole attack where you surface um, or, or you host malicious code on somebody else's infrastructure, and so it becomes essentially uh, a wide and recursive game. What has happened recently in the danger zone? We have had uh, the Revil gang attack the uh, Colonial Pipeline through a provider. Uh, we've seen SolarWinds, which is kind of the canonical example at this point, because the impact was so wide. When we have a highly privileged piece of software, like a server monitoring agent or observability and security, those kind of tools generally need a lot of access to the underlying system. That's because necessarily they're performing a task on behalf of humans, and instead of having a human go in, kind of check the process table every so often, we have something else to do that monitoring for us. That kind of highly privileged software, if attacked, of course, then has um, complete control of the underlying system and can perform uh, sort of behavioral um, obfuscation and kind of hide what it's actually doing. In the SolarWinds case, that was by using uh, very, very similar debug style out, um, network messages to the underlying product, but just to, um, to a maliciously hosted DNS server and running command and control that way. The network effect of this, because one provider is attacked and that piece of software is installed in 50, 100, 1,000 places, it becomes um, a, a huge amplification of uh, maliciousness, perhaps. What else have we seen? Uh, CodeCov, that was attacking a CI build. And, and the, the point here, as SolarWinds was, 
is that CI is highly privileged, and therefore the software factory makes some sense, as I will attempt to convince you of. Um, notably here, the last one as well, Xcode Ghosts was a concrete implementation of the reflections on the trusting trust issue, which was a compiler that, it, it was a backdoored version of Xcode, and uh, it would compile artifacts with a command and control botnet um, client in it. So anybody who compiled an artifact with this and distributed it was then putting their consumers onto a botnet inadvertently. Tag Security, one of my favorite places to hang out, has this useful catalog of supply chain compromises that groups a lot of the attacks that we've seen in the past few years into categories. As we can see, source code is the preeminent attack path here. That means getting someone's, someone else's code into, well, getting malicious code into somebody else's repository, but hot on its heels, developer tooling. We'll look at how this, this works with, uh, with the demo in a bit. Publishing infrastructure. At that point, of course, this is our CI CD systems. This might be, um, well, in, in fact, the, the next group, trust and signing, um, trust and signing as well, getting into the publishing infrastructure and either changing the source code just before it's built. That was the SolarWinds style attack. It becomes very difficult to determine what's occurred there because the compiler takes in trusted inputs on the assumption that the build server is secure. When we consider what a build server does, it's remote code execution as a service. It's running on behalf of developers in order to save them from the job of manually packaging their bits and shuffling them off somewhere else. It's necessarily highly privileged. Therein lies the uh, attraction for an attacker. When we look at trust and signing, often that is also a function of the build server. Those keys will be available or there'll be a signing endpoint that the build server has permission to push um, artifacts to and receive signatures in return like a KMS system. Again, it's the process of being on the build server and in control of its behaviors that opens up um, these, uh, these types of attacks. And of course, we can chain them together. Negligence makes an appearance. Um, notably, that's for a PyPy typo squatting attack. Typo squatting is the, the process of taking something like event stream with a hyphen in the middle, copying that package to event stream without the hyphen, and when developers are happily just manually defining their dependencies on the command line, both of them resolve. And the attacker keeps the malicious typo squatted secondary package up to date, and then at some point decides, once it's got 100,000 installs a week, to add their own piece of malicious code, maybe as a transitive dependency, so it's not clear to the original package, and uh, therein lie the problems. Fortunately, the manifestations that we've seen of this so far are generally looking for crypto wallets. If they start looking for SSH keys, GPG keys, your AWS credentials, then we might see these kind of things taken a little bit more seriously. So how do we attack? Well, we can get into a developer's machine. The end user device, if it has a specific um, endpoint protection, may detect some of this, probably not. It's legitimate that we're using our credentials. Getting into the source repository, well, that makes some sense. It does leave a trail, of course, because um, we, we have uh, everything is a Merkle tree in Git, and that means that we can't rewrite that history unless we're force pushing. So once the attack is in there, as long as the repository has suitable, sensible branch protections, we'll be able to detect it at a later stage. The build infrastructure, of course, we've been talking about this. Hosted build infrastructure um, still suffers the same problems. It's a question of access, and uh, we'll look at how to detect compromises of build infrastructure as we progress. Or we go into the trusted supply chain. We, we move backwards from what the developer's doing um, in their repository, and we say, okay, well, you're pulling in this dependency. I'll attack that dependency. Or that dependency is pulling in yet another dependency. That's, that's where we'll start. Any of these things can can run code, and if we consider where we might want to put that code, it doesn't matter. We can put it into the test suite. A test suite, while it may be exercising the underlying code, also has the ability to just dump environment variables, read things from disk, push off to DNS servers. Um, we've also got the potential for command and control, even if we're restricting what we allow into our organization, places like GitHub and 
Docker Hub image registers, we can publish to those as well. So even running um, air-gapped or offline infrastructure poses some sort of problem without being very strict. And uh, I say air-gapped in the cloud sense, very strict and doing things like running split horizon DNS. So really just keeping this code out of production is the, the first line of defense. Finally, of course, we can actually attack the runtime environment, which is to say, well, everybody is using, for example, uh, Debian or Ubuntu. Let's attack, well, let's attack one of the common packages in there. Fortunately, that is significantly more difficult because we have a lot more eyes on that code. Open source has a, kind of a variance of how many people are taking the, the supply chain security seriously. And fortunately, there's been a lot of effort put into things like reproducible builds. And of course, uh, the, the fact that there are a lot of trusted maintainers um, who are known individuals in those domains. So in sort of order of, of difficulty, um, it, it's certainly the most difficult. We have had Salsa released recently, which is a supply chain security framework. It does base a lot of its assumptions on the fact that your build server is not already compromised. If it is, a lot of these things, uh, these things fall, fall down. But this is an example of various places you can attack a build. Obviously, um, if we bypass the code review or we don't have four eyes, as in a secondary individual merging code, uh, that there's potential for uh, any old junk to be committed. We can compromise source control. Of course, again, we're leaving some evidence of what we've done there. Modified after source control, well, that's a bit more interesting. That's our SolarWinds style attack. Um, compromise the build platform. Again, it kind of, we're in a very difficult situation when trusted infrastructure is compromised. Bad dependencies, yes. Bypassing CI, CD altogether. So just pushing straight into a package registry. Arguably, you could do that by getting onto the build server and uh, exfiltrating those credentials. You generally need a network route to do that, of course. Um, and yeah, uh, bypassing, compromising, and uh, bad packages. OK, so let's put some meat on these bones. If we have an application dependency that we install from the internet onto our device in the process of building software, perfectly legitimate use, uh, we can potentially have that run malware. And, and I'll give you a quick example here. Um, let me see, game, game over approaching. So, how are we doing? Um, let's make that simpler. Uh, right, so what we've got here is an NPM package. And as you can see in the package itself, it's an NPM malicious implant example, and we have this marvelous pre-install hook. This means that before the package does anything, it runs arbitrary code. Who is looking after that code when it's pushed into NPM? It's, it's not us, that's for sure. So hypothetically, we're just pulling a package, especially if we're looking at something that's been typo squatted, we might expect this to be legitimate. And we'll just do an NPM install of, uh, in our local directory. And this is my example script. What can we do? Well, we've got the permissions of the user running the script here. These are, uh, I mean, yes, we could do a denial of wallet attack on someone's laptop. That's probably not very sensible. But these are bits of credentials, um, truncated bits of credentials from my SSH directory and my cloud providers. And this is a very real concern. Operations engineers uh, may have innumerable different Kubernetes clusters listed in their kube config. So this is a very difficult thing to protect against. There's no malware detection. There's no antivirus that will stop an install performing local file system actions. That's the point. That's what it's there to do. So that is the first uh, attempt. W what can we actually do here? Well, 2FA really is the, uh, the, the defense. There's a reason that we put passwords and things, and that we have YubiKeys, and we have physical auth tokens, because otherwise, these things are very easy to exfiltrate. Um, plain text credentials, yes, of course. Um, <laughs> crypto wallets really are the main target of all of these attacks at the moment. So um, if you have money in them, I'm sure you know how to look after them, and, uh, and air-gapped developments. OK, let's look at a different demo now in Kubernetes itself. 
So the principle here is that I, as an attacker, have managed to get you to run something in production that contains my code. There's a few ways to do this. It could be uh, an Easter egg style attack where um, it requires some form of trigger. Maybe that's a the time and date. Maybe it's an identifier in the cluster itself. And the idea is that I sit on the internet with an open port that's linked through to my machine. I get the malicious image, and, and actually there's a wonderful way to do this with, um, with an app called uh, Docker Scan that will trojanize applications just by messing with the LD preload. So you can't even see the thing happening in the, uh, in, in the container's file system startup. It's metadata in the OCI image. And so what this does is when the container starts, it fires a reverse shell, and it's called a reverse shell because you're going back to an attacker-controlled endpoint from inside the infrastructure back out. So it punches through firewalls, of course, because if you have internet access, you're just going to resolve a host and port combination. And then I'm listening on the other end. Um, let's have a look at how this works. Uh, in order to get the reverse shell, oh, this is a prayer to the Wi-Fi gods, incidentally. In order to get the reverse shell, we use something called ngrok, which is just free TCP forwarding. So that's opening a tunnel. What we've got here is a local listener, so that's just running um, ncat here locally. And that won't do anything until we have done this. So what we're going to do here is just create uh, a pod. That pod is running this reverse shell to the resolved IP of the Angrock tunnel that we've just opened. This is the joy of having Bash in your, uh, in your containers because you've got this virtual dev TCP endpoint that we can use for nefarious activities such as this. Then we do a dynamic rewrite. So let's enable host PIDs. Let's, uh, let's make ourselves privileged. And with those two things, we can either remount the host file system into the container or we can NS enter the host namespaces um, and let's, I, obviously in this situation, I am privileged uh, in that I already have the capacity to very slowly potentially deploy to the cluster. Let's see if that actually does anything. Yes, eventually. Um, <clears throat> okay. So let's run this. It will, um, it will spit out the YAML that it runs as well. Uh, you, can, <laughs> you can see because this is um, because this is a publicly this is a public IP. People are scanning this range, and somebody's just tried to connect to uh, to my laptop. Oh, wonderful! And terminated this command doesn't look good. What have I done? Hmm. Okay, so that's halfway there. I think it's because there's new lines. Nice. There we go. So what have we done? We've just dynamically created uh, a reverse shell to the endpoint that we've created here. We have lobbed a privileged security context in and enabled host PID. And there we go, there's the reverse shell. So what does this mean? Well, I'm now inside a container in your infrastructure because you ran a thing that I hid a backdoor in, essentially. And from here, of course, we've got the canonical uh, what is available. Let's map, well, we know that we're, oops. Uh, we know that we're in a privileged container because dev is unmasked. We can see all the things in here. Um, and because we can use DF to see where Etsy hosts is mounted in by the container runtime, that's leaked the name of the underlying disk. And then we can remount that into, whoops, Daisy. <laughs> Drat. Okay. Um, I'm just going to do that again for the sake of actually finishing that demo because I managed to close the window. So if I just delete that deployment and then rerun the shell catcher. 
So that's now opening another public IP and port combination. Then I'll rerun this. And it's not there. And I expect that also to, there we go. And that then fires this. Okay, so as we were, we can see, let's remount this into a mount endpoint. And then we can see, so that's the host file system. And from here, we can do whatever we like. We can go and exfiltrate thing. We can pull the authorized key. Well, we can pull any private keys that are sat in the host file system. We can add our own keys into authorized keys if we want to get there. We can also um, circuitously by this route fire off another persistent uh, reverse shell and, uh, and just jump straight in. It's game over for that node. Without node authorization, it's game over for the cluster. And if there are any privileged workload integrations, it might be game over for the cloud account. Okay, so, so that's what happened. We went outbound to the developers, uh, sorry, to the, uh, so from my machine, I created that public socket. I ran the implant, which then connected back to it. And then I've got essentially a command and control session, a reverse shell into the, uh, into the victim. The point here is that we do not want under any circumstances that to happen. There are ways around this. We've got things like Trivi to scan our images, which should prevent some of these things. Of course, we need somebody to detect a malicious image in the first place. Obviously, we want security context. There's build time behavioral analysis that we can do. And eBPF, of course, is the buzzword and the thing that will help us do that. OK, so let's move on into the last section of the software factory, um, looking at policy and attestation. As we've said, Signing is the easy part, verification is more difficult. Um, Mike and Tim uh, from Citibank did a great demo yesterday, on Monday actually, at Supply Chain Security Con, with a modern implementation of the Reflections on Trusting Trust attack that is going into the build server and swapping things out, and looking at how we can use uh, Cosign, which is, uh, which is part of the SIG store, suite of tools to protect against that. Um, yes, and that demo is, uh, there we go, slow and loading. Um, th that demo is available. I think the videos for that will be out in a, in a couple of weeks and well worth a watch. Okay, so looking at all those problems, how do we fix them? Signing is the way. We take a public and private key pair, uh, we use some data and we create a signature that can then be revalidated at a later date with the public key. In terms of build server attestation and security, we can also sign each individual build step. Now this gets difficult because we need to know that the inputs and the outputs stay consistent. If we're performing a transpilation or a compilation step in the middle, then we're just signing the fact that a build step occurred. This is better than nothing, but still there are constraints to what this can do. Intoto is the de facto tool to do this. It's integrated into Tekton chains at this point. And, uh, and there's a lot of work ongoing in there as well. We can also sign container images. So we've got those individual signatures for the build stages that creates an artifact. That artifact is then trusted in inverted commas. Um, and we can then go and sign the thing so that again, we can revalidate that at a later date. And SIGSTOR um, and Notary V2 are the emergent forerunners in this space to, uh, to effectively sign our artifacts. Recore as a transparency log operates in the same way as the Let's Encrypt style of, uh, of certificate transparency log, where all our metadata is put somewhere public so that anybody can revalidate it at a later stage and be sure that it was us doing the thing to the artifact. There's all sorts of different parts of SIGSTOR. Uh, the, uh, the maintainers have just started a company around this as well. They have a booth here somewhere. Um, they are called ChainGuard and well worth the conversation. And uh, I've, I've got a quote from, um, from Mike himself here, software does not compromise itself. It's humans that are the problem. And if companies don't publicly provide transparency into what is inside their compiled artifacts, so what happened in the build, this is the software bill of materials that again, there is a lot of conversation about this week. If, uh, I mean, perhaps it's the wrong thing to say, but um, if, if, you, if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear, or something around that, 
Ultimately, we want to know if somebody ships us a binary artifact with a compromised package in, because we want to upgrade that. When there's a zero day released for a dependency that's packaged and deployed in our systems, we deserve to know so we can take remediative action. Okay, so underpinning all of these things is a question of identity. Spiffy, another CNCF project, is ephemeral workload identity. This gives us, a, it signs a certificate containing metadata about a process and with a very short expiration that can be used to, or it can be used as the root of trust for signing, it can be used as an identity. Istio uses this concept for mutual TLS for workload identity, and it's incredibly powerful. All of these projects are kind of being uh, smushed together in this concept of a software factory in order to give us, um, and in Toto Golang is uh, again another integration, um, in order to give us this kind of end-to-end -end signing. And this takes us to the software factory. So what is this? It is building pipelines that build other pipelines so that our DevOps is strong. Um, that is Bertha, the uh, 1980s children's TV show in the UK. And it means that we have a strong baseline of DevOps skills, if you like, and the ability to stand up new infrastructure very quickly, aggressive automation, and it welcomes signing approaches. So there's lots of different moving parts. It is a large, complex, um, not intractable problem with a lot of different organizations um, working, to, uh, working to deliver a sort of canonical um, implementation. The Department of Defense is one of those organizations. They have built a reference design. It doesn't come with an implementation. It's a white paper. So um, a control plane and colleagues at Citibank and the Tax Security Supply Chain Working Group um, are looking to build out a concrete implementation based upon these things. And of course, um, underpinning everything is this concept of rigorous automation. Um, the reference architecture, I apologize for the slow image loading on these. Okay, so what we're looking at here is a subdivision of different trust domains. And in the bottom corner, we've got the source control. And then in the bottom green, uh, box, we see an identity attester. That is a privileged process that is looking at metadata about processes running on the same system in order to uniquely identify it, attest to its identity, and then provide that as the root of identity with which to mint a certificate. Um, I'm sure there's a nice image there. Okay, so the, the trick here um, oh, all right, so just, just to roll back slightly. So, different views on the software factory architecture here. What we're looking at here is a Kubernetes system running Tekton, the distributed build system um, that's uh, actually underpinning Jenkins X2, I think, they've, they've moved onto it. There is an assumption here that the cluster is secure, that the, the infrastructure, that the SREs, that people with access to it, it's all locked down. Once that assumption is valid, then we see we have Tekton here, which is able to perform these individual task runs which are our build steps. Tekton chains ensures that the steps are run, generates that signature and pushes it out to a signature store and recore. So again, that's the public transparency log and an evidence lake of some description. Um, and then we see we have also got our, uh, our signing key um, in order to get that SVID. And at the top we have Spire, which is that workload identity, it's, it's that dynamic attestation um, and, uh, of uh, which means certificates for us to use in signing. None of this solves the problem of compromised build infrastructure. So how do we fix malicious SREs or underlying, um, maybe the supply chain attack against our, our hosting provider? The trick is to run it twice in different places. This is already done by the Intoto project, uh, which supports, well, it, it, Intoto supports this. Um, this is how our operating systems build packages globally distributed builds, um, the idea being if one of those builds is compromised and we have reproducibility for all the artifacts that we build, we compare the hashes. And if the hashes don't line up, something's changed. That might be non-determinism in the build, that might be the introduction of temporal data or a change of locale, so things are ordered differently on disk. They go into a compressed artifact and they have a different ordering, so there's a different hash. But on the assumption that those things are normalized and we actually have full reproducibility of the artifacts that we build, 
this is, uh, this is the de facto mechanism by which to detect compromised build infrastructure. Going all the way back to the software factory pattern, the software factory should be able to build itself, it should be able to recover from disaster um, effectively, and it should be able to build other types of pipeline very effectively as well. Once that level of automation and sort of rigor has been achieved, this becomes a natural extension. Up until that point, there is a lot of work. It's difficult to front load this kind of effort, and um, I'm not gonna try and say that it's not, but once we have that solid baseline, the evidence lake becomes a comparative place where we can essentially detect signals of compromise in a way that's very difficult to do otherwise, as, as we've seen. The uh, SIGSTOR um, group have put together this, uh, and, and Dan Lawrence is here as well, um, put together an excellent white paper if you'd like to read more on that. That is the end. That is Captain Hashjack, and thank you very much for your attention.